If you're a newbie to AWS, chances are your experience goes something like this. You create a new AWS account, you log into the AWS console as the root user, you build some things, you test them, and everything just magically works. Then you deploy an app or a feature to your users or your friends who are helping you test things out, and nobody can access it or nothing works. Oh! Suddenly, you care a lot about Identity and Access Management, or IAM, and this here, Google, is probably your next step. Maybe you can relate. I know this was definitely my experience when I got started. So in this video, I'm going to try to distill what I wish I had known and explain it in a way that's hopefully easy to grasp. IAM can be a little bit overwhelming at times. So in short, Identity and Access Management is the service that's used to securely control access to your stuff in AWS. It controls authentication, the who, as well as authorization, meaning what can they do. There are four main concepts we're going to cover, users, groups, roles, and policies, and let's take it one step at a time by actually doing these things in the AWS console. So I'll start by navigating to IAM, And users and groups tend to be pretty straightforward for most folks, so let's start there. Let's go to Users, and we'll create a new user. Let's start with a user for Michael Scott. And if we want Michael to be able to access the console where we are now, we'll need to tick this box. And then we need to select a user type. Now, these days, Amazon tends to be pushing us towards using the Identity Center. That's the recommended way to do things. That's a whole different video. I've actually got two videos for that, one about the theory, and then one on how to actually set it up and use it. So definitely check those out since those are the recommended way to do it. But I want to just go through the core concepts of IAM generally. So we are going to skip that and just create an IAM user. For passwords, I'll create a custom password. And generally, you want your users to create their own password when they sign in next. I'm going to untick that, though, just to keep life simple, and then we'll say next. We're not going to deal with groups yet. We'll just go next and create user. Now, here are the instructions for how to log in. You can also download a CSV file here with this information or email the sign-in instructions to Michael. For now, I'm going to copy this URL to my clipboard. We're going to need it a little bit later, but let's go ahead and set up another user. I'll return to the users list and go through those same steps. I'll just quickly go through these for Dwight Schrute. Just a regular IAM user, custom password, and next. No groups and create user. Incidentally, I should point out, you might have noticed the message on the last one, but this is the only time you're going to be able to view and download this password, so you've been warned. I'm going to go through those steps for one more user for Pam Beasley, and I'll be back in just a second. Okay, so we've got three new users, one for Michael, one for Dwight, and one for Pam. And Dwight is pretty happy about this. Now, this is a good time to point out that as a best practice, Amazon recommends that you always work as an IAM user and never in the root account. The root account is automatically created when you create an AWS account, and it has full access to do everything, including billing, which can be great when you're getting started and learning things, but if that account is ever compromised, you're in trouble. So it's best to initially log in as the root account and then create an IAM user, like we just did, that has the least amount of permissions they need to do their job day to day, and then you lock away the root credentials and don't use that account. Okay, back to the console. Now let's move on to groups, or more specifically, they're called user groups. And as you would expect, a user group is a collection of IAM users. So let's create a new one. One for developers. And then we can add users to groups from this screen. So let's say Pam is a developer. We're going to touch on permissions and policies later, so for now we're going to skip all of this and just say create the user group. Let's create another group, this one for testers. Here we'll add Dwight, 
and create. And then I already have a group called admins. I'm going to add Michael Scott to that. So add users, select Michael, and there we go. If you didn't have that admins group, just create it like we did the other two. All right, we've got users, we've got groups. I think those are fairly straightforward. So let's move on to the next concept, which is roles. If we look at roles out in the console, you'll see it says that a role is an identity that you can create that has specific permissions with credentials that are valid for short durations. Roles can be assumed by entities that you trust. Okay, in plain English, a role is kind of similar to a user in that it's an identity that can have permissions to do things in the system. But a role does not have credentials as you might traditionally think of them. There's no password or keys or anything like that. A role can be assumed temporarily by anyone or anything that needs it. And if that doesn't make it any more clear, let's go through an example to hopefully illustrate why roles even exist. So say that you're creating an EC2 instance video above if you want to learn more about EC2, and it's going to host an application. That application needs to be able to use an S3 bucket for storing and retrieving files, and it also needs to publish logs to CloudWatch. This is a pretty common scenario, right? But how would you go about this from an IAM perspective? There's a couple options. Option one would be to create an IAM user for the application that has the appropriate permissions to use S3 and CloudWatch. You would then hard code those credentials into the application or store them on the instance's file system and retrieve them at runtime. Now, even if you don't know anything about how this works, that option should hopefully intuitively feel pretty gross. Hard coding credentials and or storing them on the file system is never a good idea. So let's agree that this really isn't an option at all, but this scenario is really why roles exist. The second option, and honestly, really the only option, is to create an IAM role with the appropriate permissions for S3 and CloudWatch. Then when you go to create your EC2 instance, you would assign it that role. By doing that, the instance assumes the role and would have access to S3 and CloudWatch, but there are no credentials required. And in the console, when you go to create an EC2 instance, there's actually a place to assign the role. The role automatically deploys the credentials that are needed to access resources. So no username, no password, no keys, or anything like that to deal with. This is a much better way to do things. To build on the concept a little bit more, let's use the hat analogy for a role. In real life, you've probably heard the expression that somebody wears a lot of hats. In your own life, maybe you juggle different hats or roles of being a parent and a software engineer at work, maybe a soccer coach on the weekends, home chef for yourself or your family, maybe a therapist for your friends. You wear a lot of different hats and play a lot of different roles depending on the day or hour. Roles in AWS are similar. You can assume a role by putting on that hat. And when you put on that hat, you can do everything that role can do. So maybe there's a role that says you can read from S3, write to CloudWatch, and read from DynamoDB. That one role does all of those things. Maybe there's a role that says you can only read from S3, or another role that says you can only write to CloudWatch. Whatever hat you put on, or whatever role you assume, that's what you can do. And this again is using the EC2 instance as the example. But the same is true of users and groups. If you have the ability to assume a different role, you'll actually see that option in the console. So instead of just signing in and signing out, you can actually switch the role. Back to the console, you'll see that when you create a role, there are common use cases down here that you can choose from. And we'll do that in a little bit. But that's the whole idea of roles. It allows you to do certain things temporarily without you needing a separate IAM user. By the way, if you're finding this helpful so far, help me spread the word to more people by hitting that like button and also consider subscribing. Much appreciated. So to summarize what we have so far, these are the identities or the who is doing something with our AWS resources, users, groups, and roles. But as we saw earlier, just having an identity doesn't mean that I can do anything. In fact, by default, I can't do anything. If we were to log in as Dwight, 
which I've done here on the console, you'll see up here at the top right, logged in as Dwight, and I'm getting all kinds of access denied messages on the console. I can't list applications, I definitely can't get to billing information, and if I were to try to go to a service like S3, and go to buckets, we don't have permissions to list buckets. So Dwight is an IAM user, but by default, he can't do anything. Now we need to tie everything together and hit on this final construct of policies. Simply put, a policy says who can do what to which resources and when. For example, allow IAM users to rotate their own credentials programmatically and in the console. Or allow a Lambda function to access a DynamoDB table. Allow a user to start and stop EC2 instances. Hopefully you get the idea. And here's the basic syntax of a policy. For effect, you have two options. Those are allow or deny. Deny is the default that's automatically applied. So if you don't specify anything, it's defaulted to deny. And then the action. And this will correspond to the API calls to AWS services, such as S3 and having the ability to delete a bucket. And then you have the ARN or the Amazon resource name. This is the resource that you want to apply the permission to. For example, I could apply permissions to a specific EC2 instance. Maybe it's a specific S3 bucket and you get the ARN from the bucket properties. And then finally you have conditions. These are optional, but they control when the policy should apply. For example, only apply this policy if the username is John Doe or only apply this policy on EC2 instances created more than three months ago, that kind of thing. So applying those concepts to an example policy, here we're saying that if an IAM user is equal to whatever username we specify here in the condition, then the person is allowed to start and stop instances. And then here for resource, the asterisks mean that they can start and stop any instances, not just a specific one. Let's look at another example in the console. I'm logged in as my root account again, so let's come back to IAM. And then here on the left, policies. And probably the simplest policy is administrator access. Let me just open this one up. And this is the most permissive policy as well. It basically means that you can do anything. If you have this policy applied for all the different services, you've got full access the summary here, or if you look at the JSON version, we're saying allow all actions on all resources. Let's look at another one. I'll just filter down for S3. And maybe let's try this one right here for read only access. And looking at the code, this is saying that whoever has this policy attached is allowed the get star and list star, which basically means read only access on all of the S3 buckets. Okay, those policies are great, but Dwight is reminding us that at this point, he still can't do anything. And he's correct. The who, this comes from attaching a policy. As we mentioned here in our list. So we want to take the policies that we've been talking about and attach them to users, groups, or roles. So let's go do that. Coming back to our users, let's first go deal with Dwight. So I'll click into his account. And let's say he needs permissions on S3. Now I could attach permissions right here, add permissions, and then attach policies directly. From here, I could filter to S3, choose whatever policy is appropriate, and then Dwight would be able to take this action in S3. But remember, we also have Dwight in a group. He was in the testers group. So let me just back up here to user groups. And generally, it's going to be better to apply policies at the group level so that all testers in this case would have the same permissions. So attaching it directly to Dwight is not a recommended best practice. Instead, at the group level, let's come into permissions, add permissions, and attach policies.
let's say our testers are actually going to need S3 full access. And there's a policy for that, so I'll select this policy and attach policies. We'll log in as Dwight in just a second and show that he can access S3 now. But let's attach some other policies just to get some practice. We'll come back to our groups. And let's say for the developers group, we want to attach a couple of policies. So permissions, add permissions, and attach policies. Our developers also need S3 full access. So let's attach that one. And then you can stay on the same screen and just filter for another one. Let's say they also need DynamoDB full access. So I'll select that. And then maybe Lambda full access right here. So we've got three policies selected and attach policies. For the admin group, I already had some policies attached, but you can always check those under permissions. And this group has admin access. Attaching policies to roles is very similar. So if you've got a role here, or let's actually create a new role, just so we're starting from scratch. This will be for an AWS service, and we'll select our use case here. Most common one is EC2. That looks good. We'll say next. And then we can attach permissions right here. So let's say that this role is going to need full access to CloudWatch logs. I'll just filter that down a little bit more. Here we go. And read-only access to S3. There we go. We'll give it a name. Maybe our e-commerce team needs this role specifically for their instances. And then scrolling down, we'll create the role. So now if we were to start up a new EC2 instance, it could assume that role, which lets its applications read from S3 and gives full access to CloudWatch logs without needing to worry about credentials when the application's running. Okay, so we've attached a whole bunch of policies to different things, but let's just test out that it works for Dwight. So I'll log out of my current account, log back in as Dwight, and I'll be right back. Okay, we're logged in as Dwight now. You'll see that I still get all kinds of access denied, but that's okay because the policy that we attached was specific to S3. So if we come into S3, Dwight should now have full access, and you'll see all the buckets that he now has access to. Yay! So to wrap things up, we talked about users and groups. Users are just like you would think, Michael Scott, Dwight Schrute. Users can be part of groups, and you can give everybody in the group the same permissions. Roles let you temporarily assume permissions without needing credentials. A common use case here is that an application on an EC2 instance needs to assume permissions to allow access to S3 and CloudWatch. And then finally, the actual permissions are defined in a policy, whether you want to allow somebody to read from S3 or write to a DynamoDB table, all of that is specified in the policy. And then the glue that holds everything together is attaching the policy to one of your identities, the user, the group, or the role. So those are the basics of IAM in AWS. If you found that helpful, give me a like so YouTube knows to share it with more people, and also consider subscribing for more content like this. Thanks so much for watching.